Ed, if I could have you grab a seat, please. Very good. So glad to see you this morning. It has been several weeks since I've been here, and I have missed you. It's weird not to be at my church on a Sunday. And although I uh, was able to be a part of a group that just got back from two weeks in Rwanda, um, I did miss being here. And so over there is amazing, and I was instructed by the pastors there to make sure that I let you know that they send their greetings and they are praying for our church just as we are praying for their churches. So thank you for all of you that have been praying for the Rwanda trip, that have helped to support that trip. It was awesome. I'd love to tell you about it this morning, but that would take up all of our time. So what we're going to do is schedule a time later, uh, probably an evening in a few weeks from now, let you know about that. So if you're interested in hearing about the trip, that you can be a part of it. Um, suffice to say, it is just amazing to see that Jesus is working throughout the world, that we are not an island unto ourselves, that Loveland, Colorado, Northern Colorado, even just the United States is not the only place where God is working. In fact, he is working powerfully around the world, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ on every continent, and they're speaking and praising in different languages this morning, but they are praising the same God. So our brothers and sisters worshipped about seven hours ago, but they still might be worshipping. So if you've been to an African service, they don't run by the clock, so we may have to start doing that a little bit here, and that way I get about 45 an hour long a teach. I'm joking, we don't do that. But anyway, it was awesome and wonderful. Excited to be back, though. Excited to hear and be part of VBS. I got to teach the Bible stories each day, and that was fantastic. It's a totally different thing to preach littles. Uh, I, was, I was unfamiliar, the kind of hugs that you get afterwards, just random little kids come up and give you hugs. Y'all don't do that so much, um, but that's okay. That's okay. Everybody has their own limits. They feel comfortable. Uh, it was just an awesome time, and I appreciate that we're celebrating it this morning because it was an awesome thing that God did through us and with our church and so many other people that aren't even part of Grace that took part in that. So it was amazing and, and very, very good. Today, we get to start a new series, and this sucker is 13 weeks all summer long. We're going to be studying characters in the Bible, Old and New Testament. And so what you can see is this, the sermon series is titled, Our Story. And the tagline is really significant, that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And I love this because sometimes we can get trapped in the mundane day-to-day -day existence of our lives and we forget that we are part of a lineage of faith that literally stretches back to the very beginning. That God is moving in our world right now in the same way that he moved previously. That there is a larger arc and purpose and plan and story that all of our stories are connected to. And ultimately, the story is about Jesus Christ. It is his story. And the fact that we are part of that story not only makes our stories amazing, but it points to the best and most amazing story, the story of God. You are a part of that. And so when we read the Bible, when people say the Bible is boring, I just don't get it. Because when we read about these characters and we see the way that a powerful, unlimited, knowledgeable God that knows everything and knows us, when we see the way that he interacts with them, knowing that same God interacts with us, then these stories become exciting. Because we hear about the God that we know. And we see examples of regular human beings. There's nothing special about them aside from what we see in their lives as they stepped out on faith time and time again. They weren't perfect, but God used them. So I hope in these stories that you can see your story connected, that you can find yourself in these stories, and we can see how God interacted with these men and women because he's going to interact with us the same way. Okay, if you're not excited, you can probably tell I am. Uh, I've had coffee, and it's been two weeks without preaching to you, so I've been like, rawr, rawr. so we're going we're gonna to get after it in just a second now, but let's, let's do the most important thing we do, because nothing I'm going to say is important. It's going to be God's word through his spirit that speaks to our hearts if we have open ears and open hearts to receive. So let's pray that God will do that, and then we'll dig into his word. Ah. 
Father, you are good. You are so good. God, it is mind-blowing to see how big you are. God, that you are outside of time. And in your loving kindness that you are weaving together the multiple stories of billions of lives over thousands and thousands of years. And yet there is one central theme to this story. And it is your glory. And God, we are captivated by that. We want to know that more deeply in a way that brings our souls to life. God, we want to know you, and we pray that as we study your word this morning, that these won't be just some distant historical account, but instead we would would be awed at the way that you move in the, the characters that are described in your word. Father, we know that you move in our lives. We, that these are real people, that they were responding to circumstances similar to ours in many cases, and we have hope that the same way you interacted with them is the way that you interact with us. God, I pray that you will allow us to see more of who you are today, your character, your holiness, your grace, your mercy, your beauty, your splendor, and that these things will invigorate our faith, that we will live more fully and completely for you And that our lives may shine your love into this world. God, thank you for the hope we have in your son, Jesus. And I pray we will draw close to him and to you today. We pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. All right. So we're going to be talking about Abraham today. And and please hear me that when we begin these, these brief brief, and it's like 35 minutes to try to cover Abraham is is a shame, right? It's a crime. So please know that we're not going to be able to get through in the kind of detail that the actual narrative allows. My encouragement to you is go home and read it. There are going to be details in there. You're going to be like, no way. And, And just, it is such a good story. And so we're in Genesis because Abraham is significant. He is unique. And what we see in him, as we see in so many others, and our main point today is that the life of faith is marked by trust and obedience. That the life of faith for a follower of God is marked by trust and obedience. That faith-fueled obedience is actually the key to growth. And so we see this, and and, and one of the things, and, and I wasn't raised in the church, so one of the beautiful things is these hymns of the church are new to me. So whenever it says, hey, hey, do you know that there's a hymn that talks about trust and obey, that there's no other way? Okay, some of you are nodding your heads. I, I like, I didn't know. And so I went and listened to it. I'm like, this is really good. So don't, don't be sleeping on the hymns, man. There's some good stuff there. There is a hymn called Trust and Obey. And literally what, this, what it says is there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And this is really, if you were to try to pull out one thread from Abraham's magnificent story about the way God worked in his world, it would be his faith that he trusted and he obeyed even when it was difficult. Now let's unpack this with three words today, and these are going to be the three sections. We're not going to cover all of his story because we don't have time, but we're going to go through these three ideas, and that is leaving, waiting, and trusting. Leaving, waiting, and trusting. Before we do, if you're new here to grace, every week we say out loud Psalm 119, 105. This is not just because there's a a place in the sermon outline to put it in, but it is for us to say, God, when we hear your word, we hear you speak. And so we want to trust what we are hearing from his word. So if you would say this out loud with me with a little bit of gusto this morning. Your word is a lamp from my feet, a light on my path. Very good. All right, so Abraham. Abraham is the beginning of the patriarchs. And what we see are these are, are men and their wives who have been raised up for an amazing purpose as God begins a lineage that starts with Abraham will go all the way through to Christ himself. 
Abraham is unique in the Bible that he is referred to as a friend of God. Three times in the Bible, he is given this description. And if someone is writing a story of my life, that would be a really big compliment. That Abraham was a friend of God. We see that he is referred to not just in Genesis, but Paul pulls out Abraham as a character in Romans in a lengthy discussion. And then does the same thing in Galatians. That Abraham is known as the father of the faith and the father of all those who believe. So we get another song that I'm going to get stuck in your head that goes, Father Abraham had many sons. Okay, we can't go any further. Because <laughs> we'll just say, let's all praise the Lord. Okay, so there's a song. And now here's the deal. Why is there a song? Because there's a biblical truth that if you are a person who believes in God by faith in Jesus Christ, then you are part of Abraham's lineage. See, come on. I just, just start early and often to be amazed because your story is connected to huge stories. I love it. We're not just this lone island of existence, but we have history and we have an amazing lineage. And Abraham is part of that lineage. He occupies 14 chapters in the book of Genesis, starting in Genesis 11 all the way through Genesis 25. And I encourage you, again, we're not going to get to all of his story today. Go home and read it. It is amazing not just because of what Abraham does, but more importantly, the way that God interacts with him. And so we're going to look at different parts of his story, and we're going to start in Genesis 12 with leaving. This is where he enters the story formally, and we enter into Genesis chapter 12 with God speaking to Abraham directly. Now, locate yourself in the biblical narrative. So we've had the creation account in Genesis We've had the fall in Genesis 3, we've had the flood, and then we've had the Tower of Babel. So if you're kind of following in a Bible timeline, after the Tower of Babel is when we get the story of Abraham. Now, and just just do me a favor, as we read these stories, imagine it is you. Because we read these just like printed words on a page, and we forget this is a real human being. So let's start in verse 1 of chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, don't be confused, Abram and Abraham, same person. God will eventually change his name after the the, the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. And he will be changed from Abram, which is exalted father, to Abraham, which is the father of many, right, of the multitude. And so at this point, he is still Abram. Look what he says. God says to Abram, "Go go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, I won't get ahead of myself here, but just imagine you hear from God directly. Okay, just stop right there. Like, whoa. And then God tells you to go somewhere and won't tell you where the end destination is. So I want you to sell your house and your home and pack up the Winnebago and start driving east. Well, where, God? East. Okay, just just go. Go. <laughs> And so check out what he says. He makes him a promise in verse 2. And this is the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. You will bless others. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what do you do? In real life, because it requires a response of faith. What would you do? And all of us would like to think, oh, I'd do it. Yeah, I'd love to just sell everything and go to someplace I don't know. Okay, realistically, whoa. This is a big ask, but look at verse 4. So Abraham went. I love it. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old. When he set out for Haran. Now, this is just awesome because they lived a little bit longer back in those days, but they didn't live that long. 75 is still not a spring chicken. I know some of you are out there like 75, I'm in my prime. 
awesome. Abraham was probably a little past, maybe, but God called him. I love this because it's, God is no respecter of age. Because when he's got a plan for you, he's going to call you on that plan no matter how old you are. There are people that have come to Christ late in life and burned brightly until they went home. And he calls Abraham at 75. And it says in verse 5, he took his wife Sarai, who will become Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now, this is really helpful to get an idea of the kind of mileage that they, they, they're going to put on, on, on their bodies and on all the people that come with them. So let me give you a map here. And so you can imagine Ur of the Chaldeans is where they start. And Terah, who is, is Abraham's father, moves them to Haran. Now, that's quite a trek from Mesopotamia and, and, and moving all the way up to basically right before you enter Palestine. And then you can see another 400 miles that adds from Haran all the way down. This is by foot. I was joking about the Winnebago. They didn't have one. And so God calls you and your family to leave making you only a promise in his word, and then we are to respond. This is what Abraham did. Now, this is awesome because faith is one step at a time. God very often calls us to take the next step of faith without knowing the end destination. This is the very nature of faith, that it requires us to trust and believe that God knows things that we do not. Now, hear me on this. This is where we want God to be as big as he truly is. God knows everything. See, that just doesn't do it for you, but it should. Here's why. Every word on every page of every book, every moment in history, every scientific fact discovered and undiscovered, God knows everything. He knows every thought that's ever been thought. He knows every word that's ever been said. He knows every possibility, every permutation, every Dr. Strange figuring things out. He knows all of that and more. Now, in addition to that, he is all-powerful, which means that there is nothing that he cannot do except things that are outside his character to do. God cannot lie but he can do everything within his character to do. And God is everywhere at all times and all locations throughout human history. I'm just waiting for your heads to explode. A little disappointed there's not at least one cassava out there. Bam. Here's why. We need to understand this because when we do, when God asks us to step out on faith, we will be less frightened because God knows what we can't possibly know. He has already thought through the whole process of what he is calling us to do by faith. He knows you. He knows what you're capable of. He knows the effect that your obedience will have on you and the people around you. He knows everything that we cannot figure out ourselves. So what seems like a risk and a gamble when we step out on faith is no gamble at all to a God who knows everything. This is difficult, right? <laughs> that sounds good, but we live in a real world when God calls us to do difficult things and we have to trust not knowing the outcome. Abraham had to do the same thing. Now let me make a very important second point. Uh, this leaving wasn't just a matter of a physical location that he was leaving. When he left Ur of the Chaldeans, Ur of the Chaldeans was a huge city, 300,000 people. It was a metro metropolis of its day, and it was known for idol worship. And what we know from Joshua, if you read Joshua 24.2, Joshua lets us know that Abraham's father, Terah, was a, an idol worshiper. And so when God called Abram, out of, not just Ur of the Chaldeans, but out of Haran, he called him out of his old life. He called him to have different priorities and a different orientation to God, where he had worshipped idols and not know the true God. When God spoke to him, he didn't just leave his hometown. He left his old way of life. So often for believers, this is where we make ourselves a lot of trouble. 
We get ourselves in trouble when we try to live the old life and the new life in Christ because they end up pulling in different directions. Like, well, I I still kind of like this. Well, I I still kind of like that. This is as low as I can get. And, and, And so we end up getting pulled to stretch later this we end up getting pulled in different directions when we try to hold on to our old way of thinking and living and not live into the newness of life that God has called us into and so Abraham wasn't just leaving a place he was leaving an old identity for a new identity that involved God as his first priority okay now we got to keep moving what we see here in Genesis 12 and I love it because right as soon as 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 his story begins he makes a mistake, which is so good. This is why the Bible should make you at least a little bit comfortable that even the people we raise up as like examples of the faith are not perfect. So at the end of, of, of Genesis 12, there's a famine in the land. And so Abram takes his wife Sarai and they go to Egypt. Now, I just love this stuff. Abraham takes his wife and his wife is beautiful. Now keep in mind, she's in his 60s. Thumbs up to you ladies. <laughs> right? Beauty is not a respecter of age. You can be beautiful at any age. And he takes his wife down to Egypt, and he's concerned that because she's so beautiful, when they arrive in town, the Pharaoh is going to have him killed so he can take Sarah to be his wife. And so Abraham, being the very faithful, righteous man of God, says, honey, lie for me. You don't, again, it's in the Bible. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. He says, hey, tell them that you're my sister and not my wife. Now, that's a half-truth. They are related, but he basically says lie. Now, what does the Pharaoh do? The Pharaoh takes, like, sees Sarah. She is beautiful and takes her into his home, and God sends a plague on the whole palace, right? Because you just don't, you don't touch a married woman. <laughs> and, and then and the Pharaoh's like, dude, Pharaoh, I mean, Abraham, why didn't you tell me? This is the New Miller translation. But basically, why didn't you let me know? And then Pharaoh sends them away. Here is why this is so important. is because when we study the, the, the men and women in Scripture, that we need to be honest about their shortcomings while honoring their example. So often we want to deify people and make them perfect. And guess what? There's no perfect. There's no hero except Jesus. All of us are imperfect. And so even Abraham, right out of the gates, he just had this experience with God. He trusts him to leave his hometown and go 400 miles to a place he doesn't even know. And then he's scared of Pharaoh. He's human. So we want to to make sure that we understand that. Now, let's keep moving. Section two, waiting. And so what we know is that God promises a son to Abraham. And he promises that he's going to have a son and that he will have a lineage and that he'll have this this huge group of people that will come from him, that he will have this huge nation. But in in, in chapter 15, Abraham talks to God when the process isn't happening as he thought it would. So in Genesis 15, 1, Moses records, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And again, make, just imagine that you're, you're Abraham. I would love this. I would be terrified, but I would love it. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield or your sovereign. I am your shield and your very great reward. Now, there's just there's something to tattoo on your heart. Like, God protects. God is sovereign. God is good. He is our shield. I love it. And then what is he also? He is our reward. My reward from God is to know him. Just imagine God giving you those words, speaking them to you through a vision. Look at verse 3. This is so human. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. This is a big deal. Can you just stop for a second and imagine being Abram? His name means exalted father. How many kids does this father have? Zero. I think it would almost be difficult to introduce yourself. What's your name? Exalted Father. How many kids do you have? Zero. 
And at this point, the God has made him this promise, but he's saying, God, how is this going to be? I have no offspring. I'm older. My wife is past childbearing years. How can this actually happen? But look at how God responds. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if you indeed can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. You remember the last song we sang? Like stars. Okay, you're looking at me like you don't remember 15 minutes ago. Stars, <laughs> right? And, and I love it, that song. They're like, should we do a different song? I'm like, no, 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 that song. It will go with what we're talking about. And it does. You can imagine Abraham looking up and seeing the multitude of stars. We can't even count them. I'm saying, the, your descendants will be as numerous. Now look at verse 6. This is huge. Abram believed in the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, I don't have time to get into this, but what this basically means is that people have always been saved by faith. Always. The law did not change that when Moses brought it down from Mount Sinai. People in the Old Testament were saved the same way they were in the New Testament, by faith. Even then, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And this is awesome. God makes a covenant with Abraham. And there's this huge elaborate ceremony that I don't have time to talk about, but dig into it in the Word. There's a ceremony where God basically says, I pledge myself to you. I will be your God. And so this is known as the Abrahamic Covenant. But by the time we get into Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah are still waiting, waiting. And so we know ultimately it'll be 25 years before, between the promise that Abraham has given and Sarah giving birth to Isaac. And so they're waiting. And in verse 16, Abraham and Sarah are tired of waiting. So you may know the story. What happens? Well, Sarah says, hey, Abraham, you take my servant, Hagar, and, and you sleep with her, and then she'll have a son for you, and then it will be reckoned through, through him. Now, what's the problem with that? This, this, I hope you know this. The Bible is descriptive, and the Bible is prescriptive. Okay, so let me tell you what that means. There are times when the Bible describes what is happening, but doesn't encourage it. <laughs> and there are times when the Bible says, this is what you should do. This is descriptive. So in the back of your mind, if you're like, hey, we should try that, the answer is hard no. <laughs> this is actually something that we read in Scripture that causes great turmoil. Because Hagar would eventually give birth to her son, Ishmael. And Ishmael and Isaac would be at each other's throats because they would be the fathers of a great nation. And these nations would be butting heads throughout biblical history and beyond. And so this was not a good thing that they did. Remember, we want to honor the people that have walked in faith, but also be honest about their shortcomings. They were tired of waiting. Now in Genesis chapter 18, hang with me, because I know we're going over a lot today. Genesis chapter 18, God sends three messengers to Abraham and Sarah. You're not even there yet. Get there with me. Imagine you're hanging out with your wife and three special messengers, angelic messengers from God show up. They're in a hurry to make a meal for them. And then, and then they're reassured. Let's, let's enter into the story. In verse, uh, uh, sorry, not, not, not that one. In the story is, is that as they're talking, these angels say that in a year's time that Sarah will give birth to a child. And I love it because Sarah's making the meal and she overhears it. And you know what she does? She laughs. Now, this is not like, a, oh, that's rich. Ha, 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 it, It's like, no way that's happening. And, and, and here's what I love even more. is She kind of laughs to herself, which can mean that she laughs internally, so it doesn't even come outward. And one of the angels hears her and says, you laughed. Why did you laugh? And, and Sarah's like, oh, okay, so the next time an angel calls you on something, don't lie. <laughs> Just a little tidbit in case you run into an angel. But I, I mean, here's, here's the reason why I tease this out. Reading the Bible as if it's real means thinking through these things. And when we read it this way, then the, bi the Bible becomes bi autobiographical because we're reading it as if it's happening. We're understanding it as if it's firsthand. 
And I love this because the angel says, no, you, you laughed. And she's like, no, I didn't. And, and the and angel's like, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> right? Now, the, all of this is still going on, and then she gets pregnant. Now, at this time, and we're going to see that when Abraham gives birth, he's like 100. And so she's probably in her early 90s. How many women in their 90s do you know that have given birth? Good, zero, okay? So zero, big fat zero, except one, <laughs> right? Right here. Now let's look at the story in, in Genesis 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, and he said, and as he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised, full stop. God is faithful to all the things that he has promised. He is 100% faithful. Let me read that again. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. What does Isaac mean? Laughter or he laughs. Oh, come on. Nothing even on that? Do you see? Come on. Because she laughed out of the cynical disbelief almost. Like that ain't going to happen. And then when God did what he said he would do, then she had a laugh of faith. God, that I would have this joy that you promised. And my child's name is laughter as a reminder of what God can do. Okay, don't sleep on that. That's good stuff there. All right, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah says, God has, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that, that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. God is faithful. Now, the story doesn't end there. You guys know where I'm going if you know the account. Because this last section on trusting is probably the most difficult section. This is in the very next chapter. And Isaac has grown up. There's time that has elapsed between. Starting in, in verse 1 of chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Now let's stop there. Let's not get beyond a very important word here. Tested. Tested. Now, now this is an important thing because there is a difference between a test and a temptation. There's two different things. Because a test is designed by God to refine us and to strengthen us. So God will provide an opportunity that faith is required in order to reveal and to grow our faith. A test reveals what's on the inside, what's there or what needs to grow to be there. A temptation is very different. Temptation comes from within us and from the devil himself and from the world when we give into our old way of life. And so temptations are meant to corrupt us and to weaken our faith. And so this is not a temptation because we know from the book of James that God does not tempt people. But instead he gives us tests to grow our faith. And the, and the word in the New Testament is used, it's one word for both concepts. It's the same word for test and temptation. So the difference is how we respond to it. If I respond by faith, then it is a test. If I respond in doubt, then it is a temptation. And so this is what God gives to Abraham to grow his faith. Now, look at Genesis 22, verse 2. Then God said, and I want to be really slow with this, because if, if you rush over this, you're going to miss the moment. This story meant a lot more to me when I had a son. And I want you just to live into these spaces because if we run over it, you will miss it. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. 
Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. What? What? I, I have no concept of this. And so don't, don't jump to the end yet because you and I, if we're realistic, have not experienced this kind of a faith test. We've not experienced something where God said, the, the very child that the, the, the lineage will grow out of, I want you to take that child and I want you to sacrifice him. I, I, I can't fathom it. And even during the first service, I'm like, I'm not going to think about it too much because I'll start blubbering like a baby up here. If I start thinking about taking my son, whom I love, up on a mountain and sacrificing him, this is what God calls him to do. It seems from a human vantage point to be unreasonable. It seems from a human vantage point to be ridiculous. It is an ultimate test of faith. And look at how Abraham responds in verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Now, now I want you to just go real slow through this verse because I want you to look at what Abraham's saying in verse 5. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we will come back to you. Just, just take a moment. Abraham believed that he would go up that mountain with his son and would come down that mountain with his son. Now, we get a little extra insight here in Hebrews, in, in Hebrews 11, which is what's known as the Hall of Faith. And this gives us insight into Abraham's thinking. And in verse 17, the writer of Hebrews says, By faith, underscore, highlighted, underlined, circled, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his own one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, wait for just a second here. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Do you see? Even in those moments, because he trusted what God had said, what God had promised, that he believed that even if he had taken him up the mountain and done what to us would be unthinkable, that God would raise his son from the dead. If you miss the Jesus in this story, you've completely missed the bigger story. That the father took his son up to the mountain, put wood on his back, and was ready to sacrifice him. Wow. Now, let's look at verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Don't, don't move past this. In real time, imagine your son asking where the sacrifice was when you knew it was him. Think of what this does to Abraham. Think of the faith that would be required. And look at what he says in verse 8. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar, and there, an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, 
Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Wow. Can you imagine that moment? I can't. And I've tried as I've molded over in my heart, my son laying before me, staring at me, bound to the wood as I raised a knife above him. I can't, I can't fathom what it would take. And yet God stopped his hand. He says, now I know. And here's the deal. God knew what was in Abraham. So it really wasn't even God knowing. It was more about who that needed to know he had this faith. Abraham. Abraham needed to know that he was willing to follow God even if it meant giving what was most precious to him. And in God's grace, when he saw that faith, that he supplied for him the offering. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket was a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Wow. Friends, this is is faith. This is the reason why Abraham is the father of our faith, that all those who believe in him look at his lineage, and this is our example that was given to us of someone that was willing to hold God to his promises and say, God, I trust you even when I don't understand that I'm going to take the next step and the next step and the next step and the next step even if I don't know the outcome because I trust you that you do. The life of faith must be marked by trust and obedience. We see that in Abraham's story, that he, he had to leave his old way of life. How many of us, when we come to Christ, have not made that break between our old way of life and our new way of life? How many things are there within our hearts, even now, that God may be putting a finger on to free you from, that he's saying, release that old garbage and live into your new identity in He had to leave things behind. He had to wait for 25 years of waiting for God to fulfill his promise. How many of you have prayed for loved ones to come to faith for decades and nothing? How long have you waited by faith, even when it's tearing your heart apart? Abraham knows he walked that journey of faith. And he stands as an example for us waiting and trusting and finally trusting in the difficult decisions when God asks us to give up things that may seem like they're connected to our very deepest heart are we willing to walk in faith friends this isn't an easy story it's not an easy account but when we see the faith that Abraham possessed We know that God wants us to have that same faith because he's good. He's good. If we could speak to Abraham now, do you know what he'd say? God is good. Midway through our journey, we don't know the end yet. God does. Midway through our journey, it's easy to doubt God's goodness. It's easy to doubt his providence and his caring. Abraham has no doubts now. And so we look to his faith as an example for us. May we step into that faith more. May we trust that God will do all that he says he will do in his timing and for our good. Friends, it is not easy, but it's what God calls us to. And when we walk that path of faith, our lives are different. They're marked by a trust. They're marked by a dependence. And they're marked by an intimacy with God that we desperately want. Let's find it in faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I can't fathom. 
can't fully understand what we've heard today. But I know what you call us to. And for each one of us, taking that next step of faith is going to look different. And for each one of us, it's going to require you for us to step forward, not knowing what the step after will be. But God, may we look in your word and see all that you have done. May we look at your character. May we look to the cross and be able to say, we trust you. Help us to trust you more. God, I thank you for calling us to a deeper place of faith and intimacy with you. And I know by the power of your Holy Spirit that we will follow in the steps of Abraham. We love you. We thank you in Christ's name. Stand as we sing our last song.